Well, good morning. We are, uh, we are just a week and a half away from Missions Week. Anybody excited about that? And, uh, you know, that has been, over Biola's history, such a meaningful and intensive time. In, in fact, for some of you, this is actually why you came to Biola. Because you were interested in missions, maybe you're studying in SICS now, and this is, this is what it's about. And, and for others during that week, it's going to be challenging. Some of you will be challenged, and it, it, it might lead to a whole new direction in your life. For others, it, it might kind of open a horizon. Now, for some, you, you might actually feel a little bit on the outside of this. And I want to, I, I want to address you and, and all in this. Because some of you, as you hear that, you may be saying, you know, that's, that, that's great for all the missionaries. That's great for all those who want to leave this culture. And they want to share Christ. But I'm, I've come here and I, I'm studying to be a nurse. And I, I plan on staying here. Or I, I, I'm in pre-med and I, I'm going to be a doctor. I'm going to be a teacher. I'm going to be a businesswoman. Or I'm going to be a philosopher. Uh, good luck on getting a job if you... Do I have any philosophers out there? Yeah, I, I'm a philosopher, theologian. Good, good luck. But maybe you're thinking, I'm going to be a pastor in a local church, or I, I plan on being a mother, raising a family here. So what, what does missions conference have to do with me? Uh, other than maybe financing all the missionaries. Now, you know what we could do, is we could take probably SICS folk over here, put all of Biola here, and you could probably start putting away money for the SIS people, right? And so you wonder, what, what is this for me? I, I remember 34 years ago, I was sitting in the bleacher right over here. It was 1979. And I was a Bible theology major, and it was during a missions conference, and my wife and I were sitting right up here. My wife had led me to the Lord right at the end of high school. Uh, it was in return for smooches, that's why I became a Christian. But uh, yeah, there you go. She's here somewhere. She's saying liar, but anyway. We were sitting there, and I, um, we had gotten married at the wise age of 19 years old, and uh, we came right to Biola. I have told my daughters, they're here somewhere, I told them that if they get married at 19, there will be a homicide in La Mirada. <laughs> there will be a killing at Biola, and it'll be entirely justified. No, no court would condemn me. But we were sitting there at this conference, and there was a, a powerful speaker thoughtful, meaningful, and he had asked the students, those of you who are committed, who, who want to give your life to cross-cultural mission, come on down and commit yourself to this. And it was about just this many students, maybe 1,000, 1,300, whatever it was. And I'm not kidding, 80 or 90% of the people came down. There were only about 50 or maybe 100 of us sitting in the bleachers. And, I, and my wife and I, we were sitting there. And, and I felt like kind of a no good, do nothing person. Like, wow. And I, I really thought in my mind, is, is there something wrong with these people? Are they really going to go on mission trips? Is that what they're really going to do? And then I thought, well, maybe. Maybe there's something wrong with me. What, why am I not doing this? I, I, Lord, I don't have a desire to do this. I don't see it in my life. I'm married right now. I have no idea where this is all going. I'm going broke at Biola. Any relate to that? By the way, I, I will say this. In, this was 1979. Biola cost us $1,500 a semester. I, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Barry, Corey, you didn't hear that. I'm no, sorry. But I asked myself, am I doing the Great Commission? Am I doing this? So what is the Great Commission about? Is it about sharing Christ with others? Is it about evangelism? Is it about cross-cultural mission? There's a, there's a dying and perishing world. Should I go get a master's degree in engineering? Should I get a PhD in literature? 
Is it possible to get married, have a family, hunker down, live the nice Christian life here in this country and still do the Great Commission? Or is that only for the Green Berets? Is it only for the stormtroopers? So if you have the scripture, I'd like you to turn to Matthew 28. I want to talk about the Great Commission. And let me just set the the context for this. Remember the disciples now, they have seen the risen Lord two or three times in Jerusalem. And, And an angel of the Lord and the Lord himself actually told them, I want you to go to Galilee. I want you to wait there for me. And I'm gonna come and I'm gonna give you instructions. And the first incidence that we have is in John chapter 21. Don't, don't look there, I'll just kind of say it quickly. Remember, the, the, the disciples are at the Sea of Galilee and they're waiting and they're frustrated. 40 days have passed now. They know that they denied the Lord, Peter especially. And so Peter, he, he tells the disciples, you know, I, I'm kind of washed up. I'm gonna go fishing. And that doesn't mean he's gonna go put his, you know, his, his pole in the, in, in the lake and, and just have a nice day at fishing. He meant, I'm going back to my life as a fisherman. Peter is saying, look, I'm a failure, forget it. I thought I was the greatest of the disciples. I denied him. And all the disciples say, we'll go with you. And so the disciples feel like they're kind of washed up as disciples. They failed Jesus. And they're going back to their life as a fisherman. And Jesus now comes to them. And his first encounter with them, he's going to have to restore them. See, these guys think, I, I wish I had it in me. I wish I had the strength to serve Jesus. I don't think I really am that kind of person. And what Jesus is going to teach them is that you're not going to serve Jesus in your own power. You're not going to serve Jesus in your own success. In fact, the Lord, he's in the business of taking failures, just like you and me, and raising us up to serve others. He's going to teach us what it is to love God in our weakness, what it is to love Jesus in weakness, what it is to serve in weakness. And so I'll just say that some of you may feel this way as you're going through missions conference. You'll be seeing people who have given their lives to the Great Commission, and you'll wonder, God, who am I? What what, what am I in this? I've got struggles, I'm not that holy, and I just want you to know, that's exactly the kind of people that God is interested in, so that you wouldn't do this in your strength, but you would do it in his. And so now Jesus has come to meet them again in Matthew 28. This is the second encounter we have in the text. And they're in the mountain area of Galilee. And let's read the text, Matthew 28, verse 16. But the eleven disciples proceeded to Galilee to the mountains which Jesus had designated. And when they saw him, they worshipped him. But some were doubtful. And Jesus came up and spoke to them saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So notice the 11 and and probably more are coming. Jesus had said in, in Matthew 28, make sure you bring all the brethren. So there's probably even more. Some have come and now have worshiped Jesus. Some realize, my gosh, he is not only Messiah, he is God. And they're worshiping. And it says that some, see, some doubted. In, in the Greek, it's actually distadzo. It means they were hesitant. They, they were uncertain. And that means maybe some of them were not even certain it was Jesus. Maybe, but I have a feeling more of them were wondering, okay, he's the Messiah, but, but should I worship him? Is he, is he God? There were questions. And so Jesus is now going to give this commission to a mixed group. Some worshipers, some doubters, and some were hesitant just, just like us here, a mixed group. And the first thing he's going to say is this. All authority. See, here's the man, the God-man, who just some time ago, he was being crucified and he died. 
And the disciples thought, my gosh, what happened to the kingdom of God? And now Jesus says, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Something happened on the cross and the resurrection that changed everything. Jesus now says, I have the authority. There is something now about the meaning of life and the power for change. It's all different. To the Jew who's going to read this, you know what they're actually going to think about? They're going to think about Daniel 7, this vision that Daniel had. And the vision is the ancient of days, God the Father on the throne, and the books are opened for judgment, and it says, and in the cloud comes the Son of Man. And the Son of Man comes to the ancient of days, and the ancient of days gives him glory, honor, dominion, power, authority over all the nations, and Jesus is saying, that's me. That is me, I am the son of man, I am the son of God, and I have all authority. And on that basis, now go. A good translation of that, it would just, it's a very common casual verb, it's just, so go. This is not, the, the, the word go here is not the command of this. It's not the imperative. There's going to be one central imperative, and, and the word go has a bit, of, it, it collects a little bit of that command element, but really, commentators say this is a very casual word. It's a participle. Jesus had used this same word in Matthew 10, where after he commissioned the disciples, he said, now, I want you to go to the lost tribe of Israel. See, this isn't a drill sergeant saying, go, go, go. I want you to think about this. This was not a mandate. The disciples did not hear this as a mandate to go and leave their residence. They heard it as, okay, here we go again. So let's go. And where are we going? Jesus says to all the nations, Now you really need to think with me here. The disciples did not hear this as a mandate to leave the area, to forget the Jewish neighbor, and then go to the Gentiles. That's not how they heard this. They heard this as, ah, we're to go to everyone, everywhere. You see, Matthew, the way he uses this word, all the nations, it's very particular. When he wants to talk just about the Gentiles, he will never use the word all. He will just say the nations. So for instance, in Matthew 20, it says that Jesus prophesied that he would be handed over to the nations, to the Gentiles, to be scourged. That's the Romans. But almost in every use in Matthew, when he says all the nations, he means everywhere everyone including Jerusalem. In fact, in Matthew 24, he said at the end times, his disciples would be delivered up to all the nations and persecuted, and in Jerusalem, when the Antichrist, they'll really be persecuted. And so the idea here, as the disciples are listening to it, it's you're gonna go to everyone. You're gonna go wherever you are, let's go. This isn't a command to leave Jerusalem. This wasn't a command to leave Israel. And I'll just say this. For us, this is not a command for you to leave La Mirada. It's not a command for you to leave California. It's not a command to be a cross-cultural mission. It's, it's rather you're just to go wherever you are. And what is the command? What are... There is one, in the Greek, there's one command here. It's make disciples. Make disciples. Do what? Evangelize? No. The emphasis is not on just the beginning of the process. That's part of it. Evangelism is part of this process. But this is on the whole process. It's making full disciples. In the Greek, it's mafe taste. It's going to be used like 260 times in the Gospels and Acts. And what is a disciple? A disciple is one who is given total allegiance, total loyalty to following Jesus, to following his life, 
to following his teaching. It is to put one's total confidence in him. When Jesus talks about this in John 15, a disciple is not just someone who comes to the Lord. A disciple is one who keeps his commandments. A disciple is gonna be someone who abides in Jesus. A disciple is someone who learns to live life in the spirit, who lives life of good works, who bears much fruit, becomes a transformed life. That's what it is to be a disciple. In John 15, a disciple is one who will give their life to loving the brethren. In Luke 14, a disciple is one who takes up his cross, follows Jesus. A disciple is a person who calculates the cost. He thinks, my gosh, given all my desires, given what I want to do, do I really want to follow this man? Peter had said it all. To summarize, he says, Lord, behold, we have left everything for you. Dr. Mike Wilkins, our Dean of Faculty at Talbot, he wrote a commentary on Matthew, and here's what he writes about this. He says, Jesus' great commission implies more than just securing salvation as a disciple. Implied in the one imperative, make disciples, is both the call to and the whole process of becoming a disciple. Jesus spent his whole ministry guiding and instructing the disciples in their spiritual growth to become full-fledged disciples. And now he sends us out to do the same. You see, the Great Commission, making disciples, it begins perhaps with evangelism, with people who don't know the Lord in unreached communities. But the Great Commission is fundamentally about making full-fledged disciples, taking people and bringing them to full maturity. When the 11 are hearing Jesus talk about the Great Commission, they're thinking this, oh my gosh, Jesus, you mean you want us to do with everyone everywhere what you did with us for the last two and a half years? Yes, yes, it's gonna look different. It's gonna look different, but it's gonna be slow and steady. And so what, how does Jesus then talk about the process for making disciples? What are we gonna do? Well, we get three participles. The main command is make disciples, so you're gonna be going, that's one participle. And the next is, and you're gonna make disciples by baptizing and by teaching. And so first, baptizing. Here is where we're going to help initiate people into the kingdom of God. Here is the sharing of the gospel. This is proclaiming the news, this great message to a changing world. It's sharing the gospel, but baptism, it's, as, the, as the New Testament church began to think about baptism, baptism was not just the water baptism of John and repentance, it came to mean the conversion by the Spirit, transformation, dying with Christ, rising with Christ, and now learning how to live this new life that I've died with Christ and he's now in me. And they were to make disciples by teaching. Listen to this. Teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. Making disciples by teaching them to love God, to love their neighbor. Humility. Jesus taught about forgiveness. Jesus talked about not lusting. This is what it is to make a disciple. It starts with sharing the gospel, but really as 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 you think of the Great Commission, it is about taking people. It's about taking a person who doesn't know the Lord Jesus. It's taking people who do know Jesus. And you know what it's about? It's about bringing them to a point where they become a kind of people who would love to obey Jesus in all he commanded. This is all about spiritual formation. This is all about growth. The Great Commission is about spiritual formation. Wow, you know, when I was here, I I missed this. A lot of missiologies, they they understand this. A lot of them understand this, the, the real implications of the Great Commission. I didn't quite catch all of this. The Great Commission is about making full-fledged disciples of people everywhere. 
That's how the disciples would have heard it. And so the Great Commission is about sharing the gospel, helping convert people, helping them grow, doing the whole work of formation from conversion to full growth. It's the whole enchilada. That's the Great Commission. And Jesus ends and says, lo, I'm with you always, even to the ends of the earth. You See, Jesus is really gonna say, you can't do this on your own. That's why he actually is gonna say, go back to Jerusalem, wait till Pentecost, and when the Spirit comes, then the Spirit will come, and then I will be with you. Because you see, I am the transformer. I am going to live Christ through you, and I'm gonna help, help Christ be conformed in you as you make disciples. So let me, let me wind this up. Let me put some things in your mind to ponder about as you think of the Great Commission. The first is this. Some of you are just excited about the Great Commission. Yes, this is why I came to Biola, and I can't wait for a missions conference. But I say to some of you, do not be afraid. Now this is strange, but do not be afraid of the Great Commission and what it might ask of you. Some of you may say during missions conference, I don't want to go! Okay, you want to raise your hand who might say that? Yeah. I don't want to go, I don't know! Remember, the Great Commission is not about leaving your culture. It's not, see you leave the culture only if God prompts your circumstances Right? You go broke and you got it, you know what, Biola, and you gotta go home. Then you leave La Mirada. Just like he did to the early church, persecution. So when God prompts circumstances, we leave. Or when he prompts your desires. You see, God will send. The Great Commission is not a command for you to, to leave. The Great Commission is a command to make disciples wherever you are, with whomever you're with. God will send, God will use your desires, he'll use circumstances, there is no coercion in this. There's plenty to do everywhere. Second thing, have, as you're in missions conference, I just encourage all of you, have an open heart to what God might be doing in you, what God might reveal. There are some of you who may hear something and go, God, I, I really do want to leave this area and serve the Lord, or I want to stay in this area and do this. I have no idea what it's going to be, but just open your heart to what making disciples will be for your life. And third, unless you desire to leave, unless you feel moved to leave, remember this, and this is central. The Great Commission is for all believers. It's for all of us to become deep disciples and to make deep disciples where you are and with whomever you naturally are with. I remember hearing one of my friends, Dr. Dallas Willard, he asked, where is the, ripe, the most ripe field for the Great Commission? Now we would normally say, that's where the most non-Christians are who are ready for the gospel. And Willard said, we're not thinking quite right here. That's the ripest place for, a ve for starting the Great Commission. But he says, you know really where the ripest harvest is for the Great Commission? It's in the local church throughout the world. And the reason is, is because that is the place on earth where more people gather at any one time who are interested in maybe becoming full-fledged disciples of Jesus. That's why I think Paul, he went to the synagogues first. That's where he had an audience of people who really wanted to be discipled and he discovered they didn't want it. And he turned to the Gentiles. In your life, where is the greatest place to make disciples? Where is the greatest place to fulfill the Great Commission? It's right where you are. It's right where you are with those who are where you are clearly called by God to be a disciple and to do that with others. If you're a student, then with other students, 
Make disciples, grow, encourage one another. You can fulfill the Great Commission. The, the beginning of this for you is right here, growing to be a certain kind of person, learning how to help others grow in this whole process. And then I'll say this. When some of you leave here and your mothers, you know where you will fulfill the Great Commission? It's making disciples of your children. I've talked to mothers who feel like, God, I just feel like I'm not part of the Great Commission. I feel like I'm not part of God's work. Oh my gosh. Did we miss the Great Commission? It's what Dallas Willard called the Great Omission. Because it's about formation. It's about growth. It's about disciple. Your, your, your children are your disciples. Your husband. And when you're a father, you will greatly fulfill the Great Commission in making disciples of your children. I can't tell you how many missionaries now that I've, I've gone around the world in other countries and talked to at seminaries or whatever, people saying, you know, I was the son of a missionary, the daughter of a missionary, and you know, I hardly ever saw my parents. That's strange. That's something to think about. Husbands and wives are gonna do the Great Commission with one another. If you get a job here at Home Depot, that's where you do the Great Commission. People who don't know the Lord, share the Lord with them. People who do, bring them to full discipleship. That's the Great Commission. If you work in a church, that's the Great Commission. Again, I've spoken to numerous pastors' conferences, and pastors will say to me, Dr. Coe, I feel, I feel guilty. I'm not doing the Great Commission. I'm not evangelizing. No, they're, they're doing the Great Commission is all the labor they do in teaching and making full disciples in the church. I'm a pastor in a local church. That's a great part where I fulfill the Great Commission. I find people have entirely misplaced guilt about not evangelizing. The guilt is not about whether you've shared the gospel recently related to the Great Commission, but it's whether you're deeply involved in being a disciple and helping others become full disciples. I tell this to others if you're ignoring your family to evangelize or to do all kinds of things, something is wrong. And then I'll say this, if some of you want to leave this culture, you hear something in missions conference or that's already in your desire, I want to go, I really do, then something of the Spirit of God is working in you deep, that is so wonderful. Go. I praise God that he has sent over the centuries people who have given their lives by uprooting or being forced to uproot and going to another culture and bringing the gospel to all places on the earth. But I just want you to notice, you, you as an individual, you do not have to leave the culture to fulfill the great commission in your life. The Great Commission is about discipleship making, wherever you are and with whomever you're around. God will send. God in his sovereignty will send his people. He will get his work done. I wanna say the last thing, is we can only fulfill this Great Commission. We can only fulfill this commandment to make full-fledged disciples as we are growing ourselves, You are only going to take people to where you are. That's why I have experienced now at ISF when people come back to Talbot in master's programs, they've been out in missions and they tell me, you know John, I went out too young, I got burnt out because out in the mission field there's often such great loneliness. There is incredible pressure in serving God there, and some of them come back and say, I really got burnt out, it was premature. My excitement catapulted me too quickly. The Lord will use everything, but I just wanna say, to do the Great Commission, it's, it's, it starts fundamentally with you learning to be a deep disciple yourself. God, what is it to walk in the Spirit? 
What is it to really open to you? What is it to really grow? See, the Great Commission is about helping others deal with their fears, their excess anger, their anxiety, all the things that, that it hinder Christ from living in them. And you can do that here, right here at Biola in this training, to become those kind of people that obey Jesus in all that he commanded and to do it from the heart. Biola is a great place to train and to grow, to learn what it is to be a disciple, to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, to learn and love everything about God's world and to become this full disciple. The Lord used Biola so drastically to change my life. And my prayer is God would continue to use this university to change yours as well. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Visit biola.edu to find out how Biola could make a difference in your life.